From creature features to gritty war stories, these movie series have been cranking out low-budget sequels for a surprisingly long time. A divisive crucible of infernal frights, Clive Barker's directorial debut Hellraiser is regarded as either a miracle of movie horror or an overly bloody mess, depending on who you ask. Is it possible for both to be true? Regardless of the film's quality, which is mostly fine, Hellraiser is undeniably visually striking, debuting Pinhead and the Cenobites in this gnarly vision of industrial hell. But if there's any debate about the quality of the original, there's little to none about the following nine sequels. Hellbound Hellraiser 2 is a pretty good time, but after that, they're awful in all sorts of interesting ways. We have such sights to show you. Want an anthology film that was edited into an incoherent mess? Try the fourth installment, Hellraiser Bloodline. An unrelated script that was grafted onto the series with little relation to what came before? Try the incredibly poorly named Hellraiser Deader. The series didn't go direct to DVD and truly off the rails until the fifth installment, 2000's Hellraiser Inferno. But sequels continued and we also got a less soulless and more thoughtful remake film in 2022. Released in 1990, Tremors is a classic creature feature that you've probably stumbled upon while flipping channels across basic cable. Starring Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward as a couple of handymen in the down-and-out town of Perfection, Nevada, it's an engaging and charming film featuring some very memorable tunneling worm creatures with appetites for human flesh. With such impressive talent and solid practical effects, it's no wonder that Tremor spawned a whole direct-video film series, and even a short-lived television show. Though Fred Ward returned for 1996's Not Bad Tremors 2 Aftershocks, succeeding entries saw diminishing returns. Whether it was the introduction of flying raptor variations of the series monsters in Tremors 3, Back to Perfection, or a forgettable western prequel set in 1889, none of them ever matched the explosive fun of the original. In 2015, a fifth sequel was released co-starring Jamie Kennedy. That one isn't all that terrible. Though the quality of the films may be uneven, it's quite admirable that throughout all these installments and even the TV show, actor Michael Gross always shows as the absurdly well-prepared survivalist Burt Gummer. The fun that Gross has in the role is simply infectious. All you really need to know about the original Leprechaun released in 1993 is that a pre-Friends Jennifer Aniston is in it, a fact the marketing team got a lot of mileage out of on the film's eventual DVD release. These movies have always been schlock amongst schlock, puzzling at best. Has anyone ever found Leprechauns to be scary? Still, the teams that have worked on the various Leprechaun films at least deserve credit for hitting every single horror movie trope setting over the years. The Leprechaun went to Vegas. The Leprechaun went to space. The Leprechaun went to the hood. And it was actually pretty good. The Leprechaun then went back to the hood. And it was not. A seventh installment, the first one without original star Warwick Davis, crawled out of the direct-to-video gutter for a brief theatrical release and near-universal rejection in 2014. That still didn't stop the Leprechaun from returning in Leprechaun Returns four years later. But Davis didn't appear in that one either, and it aired on the Sci-Fi Network. It seems this Leprechaun hasn't seen a big pot of gold in quite some time. And now you're dead. The original Jarhead, released during the height of the painful and questionable Iraq War, was a gritty, realistic, personal movie about the private hell of armed conflict. It wasn't marked by big explosions in combat, but rather the existential angst and terror that comes during the moments in between. It was all set in a surreal sandy landscape that would be beautiful if it didn't invite so much dread. Directed by Sam Mendes in collaboration with legendarily talented cinematographer Roger Deakins, the movie is gorgeous, stark, and unlike any war film you've seen this side of Apocalypse Now. It's simply great, plain and simple. And then there are the sequels. Nine years later. From the director of Lake Placid, the final chapter in Company of Heroes, came Jarhead 2, Field of Fire. Then there's Jarhead 3, The Siege, and Jarhead Law of Return, which were so bad, they're barely worth talking about. So we won't. If the Brendan Fraser Mummy trilogy was like the hit TV comedy ensemble Friends, then the spin-off mythology series it gave birth to, The Scorpion King, is like the Joey of Egyptian-flavored early 2000s action horror. Introduced in 2001's The Mummy Returns, The Scorpion King was a hulking silent heel played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson in the early stages of his acting career, back when people still weren't sure what he was capable of. Though the movie wasn't reviewed well, The Rock earned positive attention as a Conan with Charisma figure, and he has since built a career in Hollywood off of that initially underestimated reputation. 
Surprisingly, the franchise he kicked off is still chugging along as well, with a style that seems to get more busy, more golden, and more like a Mortal Kombat knockoff with every successive go. The 2017 remake of The Mummy may have been a flop, but could things be different for the Scorpion King? We'll just have to wait and see. But if the answer is no, we're not too broken up about it. Nothing lasts forever, my king. That is the destiny of all kingdoms. Fans of the science fiction film Starship Troopers may be unaware of how old the franchise actually is. The source material for the epic tale of Man vs. Giant Alien Bug was a 1959 novel written by Robert A. Heinlein, while the first adaptation of the story was a 1988 six-part anime. Meanwhile, the 1997 film has built a legacy of controversy, analysis, and debate thanks to its sharp and biting satire. Regardless of it all, Starship Troopers has become an unstoppable franchise that extends to the present, with the reboot rumored to still be in development. There is a surprising amount of Starship Troopers content available, including video games, an animated series, and five feature-length films. The first two sequels, Hero of the Federation and Marauder, were direct-to-video projects. Marauder managed surprisingly decent reviews, thanks to the return of Casper Van Dien as beloved bug killer Johnny Rico. Two additional animated films, Invasion and Traitor of Mars, are must-watches for only the most die-hard of fans. There's nothing in the rules that says a dog can't play basketball. And there's no rule that says that same dog can't spark a massive franchise in the process either. From its humble start in 1997 as a feel-good family movie about a canine athlete and the boy who befriends him, Airbud's evolution was slow at first. There was the traditional sequel released in theaters in which the dog plays football. In the new millennium, he learned how to play soccer, baseball, and finally volleyball, all of which made sense to varying degrees. This could have easily gone on forever, until someone had the brilliant idea to leave the sports behind, as well as anything resembling reality. In 2006, Air Buddies introduced talking dogs, and suddenly, all bets were off. Over the next seven years, the Buddies faced some serious snow, went to space, did Halloween, made a lateral career move into archaeology, gained superpowers, and met Santa. Santa Buddies then split into its own universe, with a prequel called The Search for Santa Paws, and a sequel with a surprisingly serious subplot about a widower and his children. The world of Airbud is honestly one of the most confusing cinematic universes out there. The last Air Buddies adventure was released back in 2013, but there's still time for the Buddies to broaden their horizons. Broaden our horizons? We're lost in space, dog! I think our horizons are broad enough. The original 1997 Anaconda film about an oversized snake terrorizing a documentary crew in the Amazon rainforest was a forgettable project released amidst the barrage of killer creature movies including Bats, Deep Blue Sea, and Lake Placid. Although it boasted an all-star 90s cast including Jennifer Lopez, Owen Wilson, John Voight, and Ice Cube, the film has been generally panned for its cookie-cutter characters delivered with half-hearted performances. Despite being nominated for six Razzie Awards, the movie did well at the box office against a moderate budget. Of course, Hollywood could never leave well enough alone with the Snake movie that exceeded expectations, and they didn't hesitate to bleed the creature feature dry. Anaconda offers an unnecessary four sequels, with the second film in the franchise, Anaconda's The Hunt for the Blood Orchid, being the only one released in theaters. Anaconda 3 and 4 were filmed back-to-back -back for release on the Sci-Fi Channel in 2008 and 2009. Finally, the fifth installment, also a made-for-television production, involved a crossover with another ongoing creature series in Lake Placid vs. Anaconda. As misleading as the title may be, the Amazonian snake does not fight a body of water, but rather the giant crocodiles from the similar franchise. But Anaconda is still not done. As is the case with so many other 90s franchises, a reboot is in the works. The original Home Alone is a cherished Christmas film, beloved by audiences of all ages. Everything about the first film fell perfectly into place. It was written and directed by cinema legends John Hughes and Chris Columbus. It featured a young charismatic Macaulay Culkin, and it even had an unforgettable score from composer John Williams. Somehow, these creators were even able to recreate the magic with the sequel Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Unfortunately, Home Alone was not a gift that kept on giving. You got any more? Many fans of the holiday classic may be unaware that the Home Alone franchise now extends across six movies, some more forgettable than others. 1997's Home Alone 3 was fortunate enough to feature a script from John Hughes, but it was otherwise a broad departure from the originals. Where the made-for-television Home Alone 4 went wrong was in its decision to recast original characters like Kevin McAllister and the Wet Bandits without anybody from the original films taking part in the production. 
The fifth film, The Holiday Heist, was equally forgettable, even if it did have Malcolm McDowell in it. When Disney got their hands on the franchise, more effort was put into the direct-to-streaming sequel, Home Sweet Home Alone. Unfortunately, the critically panned sixth installment ultimately destroyed the chances of the potential Ryan Reynolds-led, cannabis-infused Home Alone remake, Stoned Alone. Long before superhero films were dominating theaters across the country, The Crow was one of the first successful projects based on a comic book not named Superman. Unfortunately, the movie is entwined with the tragedy of star Brandon Lee's onset death, as he was fatally wounded while filming. However, the feature received positive reviews and has since become a classic for its dark visual tone and production design. The story of a resurrected musician set on vengeance spawned an entire franchise that includes three sequels and a short-lived television series. Unfortunately, each of the movies released set the franchise further back, culminating in the critically derided The Crow, Wicked Prayer. Many fans still hope for The Crow to fly to its former heights. Musician Rob Zombie once intended to make his directorial debut with The Crow 2037, while rapper DMX also missed out on a potential The Crow project. Thankfully, there is still hope for the franchise, as a remake of the 1994 film starring Bill Skarsgård is soon to be released. Groundbreaking for its era, the original The Land Before Time, released in 1988, was a children's movie with serious Hollywood power behind it. Directed by animation legend Don Bluth, it also featured Steven Spielberg and George Lucas as executive producers. A moderate success upon its release, the story about a group of displaced young dinosaurs grew to gigantic proportions, releasing new sequels far beyond what was necessary. The first Land Before Time sequel actually wasn't released until six years after the original, and neither Bluth, Spielberg, nor Lucas were attached to the project. Regardless, the franchise began releasing a new movie almost annually until 2007, along with a short-lived animated series that aired on Cartoon Network. Land Before Time simply could not be stopped, with The Land Before Time 14, Journey of the Brave, releasing in 2016. Although rumored to be the final film in the dino-sized collection, it's easy to imagine the Land Before Time franchise carrying on until they run out of Roman numerals for the titles. The story of what happened at 112 Ocean Avenue has become more than a legend. It's a paranormal dynasty that has outgrown its humble beginnings. The original story, as fictionalized in Jay Anson's 1977 novel, The Amityville Horror, involves a young family moving into a colonial home in Amityville, New York, before quickly being forced to abandon it after some paranormal events. The original book received its own literary sequels, but nothing compares to the number of movies spun off from the haunted residential home. The original Amityville horror movie was released in 1979, and since then there has been a smorgasbord of remakes, sequels, and satires. There are so many Amityville features that it is nearly impossible to keep track of them. Obviously, some are less faithful to the source material than others, like Amityville Karen, about an entitled Karen who becomes possessed by the paranormal house. Oh, shit! You don't have a permit to be jogging. These streets are made for cars. Regardless, it is safe to say that low-budget Amityville movies are, and may forever be, a consistent element of B-grade horror. The 2003 slasher film Wrong Turn was a horror movie nobody expected much from. The story of three cannibal brothers lurking in the forests of the Appalachian Mountains who capture and kill a group of young hikers, the movie did moderately well both critically and financially. Of course, any success for a horror movie instantly means a sequel is on the way. However, the franchise that was spawned from the original film is nothing short of unexpected. There are currently seven movies based on the Grizzly story, the most recent being the 2021 reboot originally titled Wrong Turn The Foundation. This latest installment reimagines most of the tale, with members of a centuries-old cult becoming the main antagonist. The other five sequels featured the same horrifying brothers, Three Finger, Sawtooth, and One-Eye, who terrorized Eliza Dushku in the original. Who wouldn't love a story about a troublesome yet lovable St. Bernard who wins over the hearts of its adoptive family while causing chaos around their home? What if they made that into eight movies? And what if the dog landed an acting job, uncovered lost treasure, and was voiced by Tom Arnold? The Beethoven franchise has certainly grown bigger than a cumbersome pet since its humble beginnings in the inaugural 1992 family comedy. Originally written by celebrated filmmaker John Hughes, under a pseudonym as he didn't even want to be associated with the project, Beethoven was a charming film that managed to rake in the money. So, of course, Hollywood had to suck the beloved franchise bone dry. It could be argued that Beethoven's second was a faithful and worthwhile sequel, but things definitely went downhill from there. The third installment featured a cross-country road trip, followed by a fourth movie involving a collection of new pet friends. And by the seventh film, Beethoven was being dubbed over by Tom Arnold and helping to save Christmas. You know, Beethoven 
Beethoven? You must be really famous. Because it seems like every person that lays eyes on you is just left speechless. <laughs> yeah, I've done a few things. Much like the energetic St. Bernard himself, the Beethoven series is out of control. This is one franchise that no one was asking for, but it's shot for the stars nonetheless. When the original Sniper was released in 1993, critics praised its fun approach to a classic style of psychological thriller. However, it was consistently noted as being unoriginal or shallow. For the most part, it seemed like Sniper had been discharged, until almost 10 years later when it came back for a sequel that formed a B-grade franchise that simply won't stop. There are now nine movies in the Sniper franchise, with a tenth reportedly on the way. Somehow, most of the low-budget films have managed to maintain many of the stars from the inaugural feature, including Billy Zane and Tom Berenger. Still, each of the subsequent direct-to-video sequels continued to be buried deep in the bargain bin, with the latest installment, 2022's Sniper Rogue Mission, flying heavily under the radar of most media outlets. Whether anybody is watching or not, it seems as if Sniper has many more stories to tell. Jaws isn't the only shark movie that's been run ashore with unnecessary sequels. Released 24 years after Steven Spielberg's classic, Deep Blue Sea was another moderately successful 90s movie that's perhaps best remembered for the scene where Samuel L. Jackson is eaten by a gigantic shark. And we're gonna find a way to get out of here. First, we're gonna seal off this movie. For the longest time, Deep Blue Sea remained a standalone project embraced by action fans. However, Hollywood can never resist a revival. And in 2018, they began building a franchise out of everyone's second favorite shark movie. Deep Blue Sea 2 and Deep Blue Sea 3 are both direct-to-video films that carry on the story of the genetically modified sharks introduced in the first movie. Surprisingly, the sequels are adored by fans and critics alike. In particular, the R-rated Deep Blue Sea 3 has earned itself a respectably fresh Rotten Tomatoes score. Even if they did miss the opportunity to call it Deep Blue 3. There's no report of a fourth film in the franchise quite yet, but somebody out there just has to be planning a new installment that's deeper and bluer than ever before.